evening, everybody, and a welcome to Module 8 of the AO North America Fireside Chat Series. Uh, tonight, we will be discussing uh, a challenging fracture, but, but uh, one of my favorite fractures to fix. We'll be discussing supracondylar humerus fractures. I have two other panelists in, uh, joining me tonight. Um, just by way of introduction, my name is Evan Carroll, and, and I work at Wake Forest in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. I also uh, have tonight on the panel, Josh Gary, who is made, recently moved from UT Houston to USC, and Dr. James Learned, uh, who is at UC Irvine, and uh, very qualified faculty to discuss these problematic fractures with you tonight. These are uh, our disclosures, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, none of which I think uh, pertain directly to the contents of, of, of this discussion, but, but please uh, uh, keep those, keep those in, in mind. So here's our charge. So we have about 90 minutes to, to talk about this problematic and challenging fracture. And uh, this is sort of the, 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 the layout. Uh, so we're, we have two cases to present. Uh, uh, Dr. Gary is gonna present uh, one case and, and we'll talk about that for about a half an hour or so. And, and, and Dr. Learned uh, has a case or two to present as well. And, and again, we'll uh, spend about 30 minutes on, on, on his case. So at least an hour of uh, um, time uh, directly discussing uh, some case examples, which we felt like would offer you a lot of learning opportunities and learning uh, pearls. And then we'll move on to, uh, to a brief uh, discussion about a journal article. We wanna try to make this uh, evidence-based and, and, and a good way to do that is, is to talk about an article that both James and uh, Josh and I all felt uh, was important to, to maybe have some knowledge of if you're gonna be treating these fractures on a, on a routine basis. Uh, then we'll uh, do some uh, wrap up um, and uh, try to end uh, uh, promptly at 9.30 uh, Eastern, uh, Eastern time. Uh, I would say to you that, that, that we want to try to answer all your questions and, and, and really make sure you get the most out of this webinar uh, that you can. So please feel free to use your chat function uh, to uh, uh, engage us with, with, with questions and, and we will do our best uh, to answer those questions. So without further ado, I'm going to uh, uh, invite uh, Josh to unmute himself and, and he's gonna uh, present to us uh, uh, our first case of the evening. Uh, Thanks, oh, excuse Evans. Me. Sorry, Josh, but well, before we get there, let me, I would just like to uh, uh, bring out the learning objectives. So uh, at the end of this session, we hope you'll be able to maybe be a little bit better at critically assessing uh, uh, the morphology of distal humerus fractures. And, and really translate that ability into an understanding of how to approach the fracture and how to provide appropriate fixation uh, for the fracture. We'll touch on some common complications and, and maybe ways to minimize those complications. And we'll deal specifically with how to, to manage the ulnar nerve in these, uh, in these situations. So now, Josh, my apologies. Uh, uh, please, please take it away. No worries. Thanks, Evan. And it's great to see everyone. I think we're all tired of Zoom, but what a great way to get 100 people together and talk orthopedics. Uh, so case one, this is a distal humerus fracture. I think we're seeing it uh, commonly out of the uh, out of the pandemic with all the violence coming up. Evan, if you want to go to the next slide. So we got a 22-year-old male uh, who had a low-velocity gunshot wound and, and presents with this and the paper clips telling us uh, the, the ER's love of paper clips at my old center in Houston telling us where the bullet entered and exited. He's got a normal neurovascular exam. There's nothing more proximal. He's got subcentimeter wounds. It's an isolated injury. James, he's, I think he's gotten there around you know 4.30 p.m. in the afternoon, got ANSEF, tetanus in the ED. Um, I, I guess, what are, what are you thinking with this? Is this, are you gonna treat this like an open fracture? Are you going to treat it like with a bunch of urgency or what are your thoughts? I think you kind of answered all the questions that I would usually want to, to ask when I'm thinking about those things. You know, you've got small wounds. We've got a low velocity gunshot wound. Um, he's already gotten antibiotics. I think that's the best thing we can do is the time to antibiotics from injury to antibiotics is probably the biggest thing we can have an effect on by educating all of our colleagues from emergency medicine. Um, <clears throat> and even to the, the you know, residents that we train. So for me, this one is in a neurovascularly intact patient. He's probably going to wait unless something really changes or we've, we're running a room already and we've got another room available. This is probably a next day for us. 
Evan, is this something? Oh, go ahead, Evan. Sorry. Oh no, I'm sorry, Josh. Please. I was just gonna. Is this is this something in your center that you're gonna get a CT scan on? Do you see anything here, or do you get them on all of these to to know what's going on and plan, or how do you just make that decision? You know, um, I, I think that that we're getting uh, CT scans on more and more of these. I, I look at this fracture and I see, you know, it, it looks extra articular to me. Um, so if there's going to be one that maybe I, I feel like I don't need a CT scan, it, it's possibly this one. Um, but I will tell you that, that, that in most situations, particularly when you have articular extension and articular displacement, I do find CT scans helpful, particularly when you start to get into the three-dimensional reconstructions. Uh, you know, historically, uh, uh, you know, when I looked at um, the coronal and axial reformats of uh, distal humerus fractures, sometimes I didn't find them to be all that helpful. But you know, now that, that three-dimensional reconstructions have become so commonplace and so easy to do and, and manipulate, um, I do find CT scans often helpful in these in these situations. James CT, yes or no? You know, gunshot wounds, even though the infection risk is is not the thing that bugs me, there's always more comminution than I'm expecting. Uh, oftentimes it's little bone dust that runs out of the wounds once you start to irrigate. So I'm probably interested in a CT here because I'm starting to think that I'm going to need some really distal ability to hold those fragments in place. And I kind of like to know what I'm, what I'm thinking about ahead of time. So I would probably ask for one in this case. All right, Evan, do you want to go to the next slide? Sure. Well, Josh, one thing I would mention is, is, and I'm sure you may get to this, so I'm sorry if I'm stealing your thunder at all, but, you know, the value of not necessarily in this fracture pattern, but but in, in many uh, fracture patterns in the distal humerus, the value of obtaining uh, an x-ray with, with traction, I find to be as helpful, if not maybe more helpful than a CT scan in certain clinical situations. Yeah, and you know, I think this one here is not that shortened. You can see the metaphyseal fracture line is, you know, fairly simple, especially medially. So it's not as shortened as many, but I agree a traction view is helpful. I know some people don't like it because they say it hurts the patient, but I, I'm with you. For me, the CT, even if there's articular injury is more about looking for those coronal shear fragments are going to be really difficult to see. I may help you plan an osteotomy a little bit, but I, I guess sometimes I, if, if I can't see what I need to see, then I'll do the osteotomy, but we can talk about that a little bit more. But I think that coronal shear and knowing it's there, because it may change your implants uh, and may, may, may be a little bit harder to look for with hyperflexion after an osteotomy. Absolutely. So there we are, and we talked about some further workup in the urgency. And for me, even, you know, if, if this is even type two open and not low velocity, if it's there at 5 p.m., I'm probably on the antibiotic train splint and next day, because this is a generally a fairly complex case and doing this with eyeball nurses in the middle of the night. I, I don't know that that's what I'd want for me or for my family. Uh, I'd want the early antibiotics to splint unless there were something really pressing to push me to the OR. So we can go to the next slide. And CT scan did not show any articular injury, but here are the 3D, if you wanna do the animation, Evan, here are the 3D kind of images and the spin of it. James, anything you're picking up there or anything that would impact your plan for this? Um, I think just noticing, kind of like confirming what we saw in the plane films about the medial extension that kind of the typical stuff is, is gonna be hard pressed to really capture that medial side. Uh, so I think you're going to need to be creative with the medial fixation. And I'm just looking at all the, all the fragments that this volume rendering is showing us. And I'm imagining all the fragments it's not showing us. And so I, I love these 3D reconstructions for sort of overview, but it's kind of like looking at a globe. You lose a lot of detail because it's, it's just making a smooth surface. Um, and I think for us, that's, a, that's an important understanding, but I, I, it kind of helps me understand it overall, but not a big change in this one. One thing you can see, and, and James made made mention of this, is you know that that comminution on the on the lateral side. It's always as as you said, James, a little more than you think. And I think you do get do get a pretty good appreciation of that here. You know, and in this particular fracture pattern, that's important because you know the the the, the medial sided uh, exit is, is is very low, and 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 maybe reduction on that medial side is going to you know, 
going to be a little more difficult because of its distal extent, but it's also going to be a little challenging on the lateral side because of that, that comminution. It sure would be nice in this fracture example if that lateral exit, which is so nice and proximal, had a nice crisp read to it. And in this situation, it does not. So, uh, you know, the CT scan in this, this case has, has helped me, um, you know, sort of think of, start to think about how I'm going to sequence this, this injury. Yeah, for, for sure. It, you know, I, I think no, I think knowledge is good. Now, one of the things that can be so frustrating about ballistic trauma is when you're trying to put together puzzle pieces and pieces are gone or missing or not reconstructable because they've gotten too small or it just, it can take away some of the joy from what we do. We, we, I guess we can go to the next slide and kind of think about the things that probably everyone's thinking about it, is what either you guys ever consider, is there anything that would make you treat this non-surgically? In, in this young patient, or are there any patient populations where you might let this give it a go with non-op? You know, I mean, they had a gunshot wound to the head and they had a, you know, poor survivability. Yeah, I think in most active young, not even young, but a a anyone who is sort of you know, active and, 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 you know, and still doing their own ADLs and that sort of stuff. I think for me, this is going to be surgical. I guess you could imagine a very elderly uh, uh, candidate who's hemiparetic from a stroke, who doesn't use that side, that maybe non-operative management would be, would be reasonable. But um, I think nine out of 10 times in most hosts, this is going to be surgery for me. Yeah. And then, so, so if it's surgery and I, I, in the young patient, you know, early, all the basic AO principles of stable fixation, early range of motion are really important at the elbow. We're all familiar with that. So if you're operating on them, how, how do you guys position this? What exposure are you thinking? And then what are your implant options for a fracture pattern like this, which I'd say is pretty atypical. What's your construct gonna be? You know, positioning wise, depending on, on the sort of heritage of the person that's doing it. I personally like a lateral position with this arm suspended over a radiolucent arm board. Just kind of gives me standing standing room to, to use a posterior approach. If it's a less common pattern or if this had exited a little further anteriorly and you thought you would need some, or if you had coronal plane injuries, then I might consider on a hand table and using uh, either an, a lateral or a medial approach in order to access the joint. Um, so that's why I think understanding exactly where the fracture is sets you up because the last thing I'd want is to do a big posterior approach and do the osteotomy and realize I still can't see the fracture. Yeah, are you same. going at these? Oh, sorry. Yeah, same. I mean, I think James said lateral, you know, the, I think for me, this is definitely going to be a posterior approach. I, I guess, you know, if the patient had a spine injury or for some reason they couldn't be lateral, you know, you could consider doing them prone and, 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 and still getting that good access to the, you know, to the posterior uh, uh, distal humerus to, to, you know, to begin your exposure and, and, and you know, and then, um, you know, think about how much exposure you need to do to really effectively see, reduce, and stabilize this, this, this fracture. And then what, what implants are you guys planning? Are you planning orthogonal plates, parallel plates? What sets are... What sets are you asking for for this type of fracture? Or are you going to do a single plate? Yeah, I don't think that this is going to be a, a single plate for me. I mean, this, you know, this is a, a, an extra articular fracture, and many times extra articular distal humerus fractures, which are centered a little more proximally, can be treated effectively, at least in my hands, with a single posterior lateral kind of construct. But, um, you know, th th this medial exit point is, 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 is so low, uh, you know, the medial column for all intents purposes is, you know, is, you know, uh, is almost intact, um, except for, you know, when you get to the articular margin. So I don't think this is going to be a single implant for me. I think this is going to be a, a, a dual implant kind of case. And I guess what I'm sort of trying to think about is, is, is you know, is what I want to do with that medial side that, you know, that, uh, um, you know, many of the sort of pre-contoured, if you will, uh, implants used for these fractures sort of stop, uh, you know, proximal to where that, that, that fracture ends. So, so I'm thinking about what I want to do on that medial side if I want to do something different. I think, uh, you know, on the lateral side, 
for me, I mean, you know, I, I sort of base it on fracture morphology, but uh, at least in this example, I think this would be orthogonal uh, plating, so a, a typical posterior lateral plate uh, for the lateral side. But I'm, I'm, I'm having a little bit of consternation about what to do on that medial side. Yeah, I, I, your concern about the distal extent of your of a pre-contoured medial implant is giving me the heebie-jeebies because I just I can't think of an implant from any vendor that's really going to go down and pass the medial epicondyle and have screws aiming laterally. They all aim retrograde once you're past. So I think that's where knowing the implants that you have available to you is so critical because you, you know that none of them are gonna work on the medial side in the way that they're designed. It's not really even a supracondylar fracture. It's, it's, it's transcondylar oblique almost. Um, and then on the, the lateral side, I'm probably, my, my default is lateral plating for parallel, um, but I think you can go either way and it does save you a bit of dissection, especially you're gonna have a fair amount of soft tissue injury and sort of opening this up from the ballistic tract is gonna be, there's gonna be traumatized tissue. If you wanna leave the soft tissue alone, be biologically friendly, then being posterior lateral here, I think has very few disadvantages. No, I th yeah, I think those are all concerns. I think that low exit point medially was really, uh, you know, that was really what I had to think about, about fixation, because I think a single implant here would probably be asking a lot for rotational control and the comminution posterior laterally as well. I think if that's a simple fracture pattern, maybe I'd probably still go dual, but Evan, do you want to go to the next slide and we can just kind of show what we did? So one, one thing here, I chose to do lateral on a bean bag. I think making sure you keep everything radiolucent if you're on an OSI flat table, uh, you know, some kind of radiolucent bump and even the connections for arm boards. If you can use an Urquhart board or something like that, it just makes, I think, the fluoroscopy easier. Uh, and then, you know, I chose a paratricipital approach. I didn't think there was any need for an osteotomy here with that articular entry. And then you see a picture there. I think the concern when you have the, if you're going to place implants around the medial epicondyle, and we'll talk more later, about some of the evidence uh, on uh, the ulnar nerve, but I, I learned a technique in my fellowship at shock trauma from Andy Egelsater, uh, where he mobilizes the ulnar nerve with a periosteal sleeve uh, with the periosteum and synovium, and then uses that to repair it. So if you wanna to go to the next slide, Evan, let's, there's a sh short video um, here and we can, the whole video will be online, but we'll just start it. And this is Ray Penzi doing this about a week ago, just describing what he was doing. I don't know if the volume's coming through on it, but you can see the nerve there out lateral to his pickups. And then he's mobilizing with synovium. That's the nerve that he's pointing at. And now he's mobilizing the periosteum. And so he's creating a sleeve that you can bring all the way around the medial epicondyle. And then at the end of the case, when you're closing, you're just able to leave a, use a horizontal mattress suture to repair that periosteum and synovium and the ulnar nerve, it, it usually, it not only reduces it, but it maintains the reduction. So you can take it through range of motion at the end of the case and you don't see the ulnar nerve, you know, moving anterior, it stays stable in its normal position. So when you have that, you know, plate along the medial column, especially if you're trying to go low, this is a great technique. And you can see, you can take this all the way down distally between the split and the FCU and really mobilize this anterior. So this is a, uh, I think it's a great technique. Um, uh, that Andy Egelstater's probably been doing for 20 or 30 years and all the fellows that have been at shock have benefited from it and their patients have as well. So we chose the paratricipital approach. And if you go to the next slide, Evan. Um, so if you want to start, this is just a freer to localize and then just looking at the fluoros. So, you know, it, it was funny because we thought we had a good read and you can see through the, through the medial window, you can see this clamp and then you know, we've got a posterior lateral plate on provisionally, but only two screws. I, I felt like we had a good reduction with our eyes, but it's funny how fluoro can, can kind of reveal our surgical inequities. And I think if you look here on that medial side, you know, there's still translation and shortening of probably about a centimeter. And so I think limiting fixation to, to, to hold the fracture, I think I would have loved to just clamp this laterally too, and then gotten fluoro, but with the comminution, I didn't have a good zone to do that. So having the plate in place and limited fixation and just checking, number one, is my reduction good? Number two, is the plate where I want it? 
this image really told me it wasn't. So with minimal changes, you're able to loosen the screws. And if you go just next, Evan, on the, on the fluoro shots, we're able to go back, look medial again, improve that reduction, keep going. Josh, can, can I interrupt you for one second? Ask? Yeah. So, um, yeah, that, that, I mean, I think that's a great example. You know, sometimes even when you have these very crisp reads and then metatophyseal portion of the fracture, let's say that that proximal extent on that lateral side was a crisp read where you could really, you know, put that, 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 that piece of bone back, you still see these rotational deformities. You know, it doesn't guarantee that you're going to reduce the, the, the other column. Um, so this is, a, you know, an excellent example of that. Um, were you looking at that immediately? Were you, was that a direct reduction for you? Were you looking right at that, that, that read through like some sort of, I mean, I know you didn't do an osteotomy, but a little capsulotomy or capsulectomy. Um, yeah, when I took down the ulnar nerve distally, that gives you that capsulotomy because you're taking it down mm -hmm. with synovium and capsule and mobilizing it. And so I could see it and it looked really good on the fracture line and everything looked good. It's just, I think it's very difficult to see beneath the medial epicondyle. I uh, probably could have retracted better and seen it, but I thought it was good and it wasn't. And, and Floro allowed me to change. It was direct read and it was just malreduced. Yeah, I know we're gonna discuss it more, just a little preview for our participants. We're gonna discuss sort of decision-making about you know when to do an electronic osteotomy versus when not to do an electronic osteotomy when we get into to James's cases. But you know, the one point I would make is, is that you know, even though the, the electron is still on here, there, there's still a fair amount of the articular surface that you can see uh, by by doing thoughtful capsulotomies, um, um, you know, in this in this anatomic area. So, um, and, and I think we'll talk about that more. Yeah, and I think I, my plate was a little too lateral as well. So it just you know, with limited fixation in, I've not wasted a lot of real estate on bone. And you can just see proceeding forward, Evan, if you want to mm -hmm. click forward. And then once you get the reduction, the application of implants, but here it is now checking a lateral. We've improved it. Go one more to where we get the better lateral. This is one thing I, I would say. One thing I would say here, though, Josh, is you know, for me, um, there uh, some benefits to the orthogonal plating is, is you know, when done well and, and using nicely contoured plates, it, it it you know it helps to affect both reduction in both the coronal plane and the sagittal plane. You're sort sort of reduce you know instead of just reducing from in one plane, you're sort of pushing, you know, both a sagittal plane reduction and a coronal plane reduction from the medial side. And you can see that very nicely here. It's placed yeah, nice, place nice. It, it, it really is pushing that, that, that capitellum and that trochlea, you know, into a nice position with that anterior humeral line. I feel we're very spoiled having all the pre-contoured plates compared to, you know, the father's orthopedic trauma that got us here. If you go one more slide, you'll see even a better lateral, a professional grade x-ray. And you can see we've got the we've got the sagittal plane correct here uh, by this image. But again, just limited fixation, and we're rotating the C arm, not the arm at this point, because I've got a clamp and two screws. So I'm bringing the C arm in from the side and and rotating at 90 degrees. If you go forward, Evan, one more, I think we'll be able to see that the reduction is going to be corrected now. The reduction has been corrected in the coronal plane as well, and you can see that we've medialized that plate a little bit. So you know, two screws in initially, but didn't like the reduction nor the plate placement. And so we revised the reduction, added additional clamps, and then uh, medialized the plate. Uh, and from here, I think it gets a little bit more simple, uh, apart from talking about what fixation are we gonna do on the medial side. Anything different, Evan and James, here? No, I see you, looks like you have a, a new screw hole there. So, you, you know, I think with a slight adjustment of the plate, you, you chose a different hole in the plate to put that provisional screw so it didn't try to go back to where it was. Yeah, and sometimes I find too with two screws in, I can just take one out and then if I if it's if it's just a rotational problem, I can rotate the plate almost like the the blades of a helicopter around the axle to get it right where I want it and then hold it with either a clamp or a wire just to make sure it's just where we want it to be. But we can go forward. Paratricipital proximal enough to visualize the radial nerve? Yes. So both radial and ulnar nerve uh, were visualized. This plate ended just beneath it. I didn't have to fully dissect it out as it crossed the humerus, but it was uh, it was looked for just like we were with the Gurren Hotchkiss approach uh, if we were going more proximal. Yeah. If we go forward, and I think, you know, once once we've got that side done, we can do this. Now, this is a this is something I, Andy Chu, 
who is one of my partners in Houston, is just a fantastic shoulder and elbow surgeon. And, uh, you know, the fixation construct here, you know, I, I learned at shock trauma from Eagle Sater, a lot of the mini fragment techniques. And he was a champion of that, along with Dean Lorich, who I know Evan worked with in his fellowship. You know, it's amazing how much impact they've had with the mini fragment plates. But this is just a flexible mini frag plate. And if you look there on the lateral, we've, you know, really spent some time contouring and cutting this. You can see it's been cut in the hole to make sure it's not on the articular surface. Uh, with its placement, but if you go to the next image on the DP, this flexible plate, you know, really allows us to to contour this for this very very low fracture line, and, and keep the plate, uh, well it may be in the joint, but keep it from abutting the ulna and have good length. And you can see that first screw is going in the, there kind of in the corner or the the bend of that plate uh, to really bring it into the bone. Uh, and try and uh, limit any prominent hardware, any issues with the ulnar nerve. We're avoiding the, the fossa, uh, both of the olecranon fossa and the coronoid fossa with that screw and just checking that. And, and from here, I think things are really, you know, fairly simple um, in terms of just placing more screws in the medial and lateral plate uh, to allow us to get there. You can just forward through this now, Evan, and then we can. Yeah, Have you all used frag plates like this? Absolutely, absolutely. And one thing that really jumps out at me, you know, in this case, and I know it's the case with, with Andy Chu because I've seen his work, uh, you know, a lot of the stability in this situation is simply afforded by squeezing bone together. So Josh has spent a lot of time to get that medial exit, those bones squeezed together, the proximal and distal fragment. So, you know, you don't need this big uh, bulky hunk and plate to, 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 you know, to bridge some fracture. A lot of the stability in this construct is simply afforded by making the fracture anatomic and, and, and the mini frag plate has to do less work. But yeah, almost every upper extremity case I do from the, you know, proximal humerus, certainly humeral shaft, certainly distal humerus, uh, I, you know, I have a mini frag set available. I found it exceedingly helpful in, in, in many upper extremity applications. So Josh, if I can pick your brain a little bit on order of operations, one of the Q and A's is why lateral plate first? I, I, my guess is it allowed you to sort of reduce the degrees of freedom and, and provide some control. You had some provisional fixation to make it sort of less floppy, but you could still tweak things and get it just right. Is there other, other reasons that you push for lateral first? Because I, this, this medial plate, I think it's everything you said. The medial plate is very difficult to apply and get contoured just right. And I needed the stability. Uh, I, I did not want to have the medial plate, which is not robust fixation, even with a good reduction and then lose that while I'm, I'm working laterally. So, you know, restoring that lateral side uh, and using clamps on the medial side to allow me to get to this point where now the, the plate is, I want the plate just maintaining the work of the clamps. I, I don't want it doing, I want it doing minimal work and I want it doing minimal work before I get my lateral plate on. So that was my, my reason. I still use my medial reduction read with two clamps. But I, I think regaining that stability so I can rotate the arm, check the fluoroscopic images and have the stability I need to do th this. It, it's difficult to put this plate on and get it contoured just right. It's, it's not an easy thing to get it cut to just the right length and, and, and bend it around and you're working around the ulnar nerve. It's definitely a high sphincter tone part of the case. But I think if you have it on and then you lose a reduction, that's a, that's a real challenge. Um, once, once you get there and then you lose it. There, there's nothing more frustrating for me than having something right and losing it and not getting it to the end of the case. And what size mini frag plate is that, Josh? That, uh, that is, I believe, 2.7. 2.0? 2.7 two flex. Seven. It's either 2.7 or 2.4 flex. And so for, you know, I think like Evan said, once we have that, you know, it does get simpler. You can just come through the rest of the floors now, Evan. We can see just, and those are just images showing that we're not gonna be in the fossa, either the coronoid or olecranon fossa. We are putting some screws across the fracture line. It's not a pure bridge construct. And you can just move forward and we can get to the next slide with the uh, final images. But I do think placing that first screw in that, at that bend, down below the medial pecondyle is a critical thing when you're trying to do a plate like this to make sure the length is right. So yeah, if you wanna to go to the next slide, Evan, I think it'll have two shots of the final construct. So that's that's where we ended up. And it was a two seven mini frag, Evan, and then a posterior lateral plate um, and, and chose orthogonal here. I, some people may choose, would any of y'all go with a parallel plating with a lateral column plate uh, directly lateral rather than posterior lateral? <laughs> 
Sometimes I'm not sure I would in this case specifically, just, you know, we talked about sort of the soft tissue injury and the, the more you dissect in these, the more things just tend to fall apart because it's already kind of hanging on by a, by a thread of periosteum. So I would probably avoid dissecting over the lateral side to put a laterally based plate on it. Yeah, I agree for me that I think this is orthogonal or, or, orthogonal plating. I mean, there are certain fracture morphologies where maybe parallel plating makes more sense and, and, more, and some fracture patterns, especially if there's sort of coronal plane involvement, obviously, where orthogonal uh, uh, plating may make more sense. But, but I think uh, this similar construct for me in this particular example. Well, great. Let's go to the next slide. I don't know if there's much else or if that's it for this case. There is at six weeks. I, I'm going to, I, after surgery, I always get asked, will I do, you know, am I going to range them or splint them? I, I tend to, I, I hate splints on elbows. Um, I, I let them range day one because I, I feel like my job in the operating room is to get them to a point where they can go full flexion, extension, pronation, supination. Some people are concerned about soft tissue and we'll get a splint off at three or four days but I try to have them move immediately. Uh, that way they don't come back with a splint on three weeks later in clinic if they've missed an appointment or chosen not to show up. But we repaired his ulnar nerve uh, with that periosteal sleeve and at six weeks his range of motions now, like his left side still has some healing to go, uh, but no symptoms of the ulnar nerve. And you know, if I, after I repair that nerve, I, I flex and extend the elbow and make sure it stays put. But that technique from Agelsader has been a, uh, it's been a, a very good technique that's, uh, I have not seen a lot of ulnar nerve symptoms uh, in the long run with that technique that weren't there preoperatively. Excellent. Other questions, other questions that have come up in the chat, James, that you see that we should address before we move on to your case. Uh, just a, a question about older patients. Uh, I hope we're not getting that many older patients with ballistic fractures at exit like this, but I think you know older patients, poor bone quality, we're probably looking more at a typical supracondylar pattern, uh, likely using bridge plates or, or considering arthroplasty in an earlier setting. Yeah, I'd say that I mean, we're seeing, I think we're seeing people shot at all ages that are innocent bystanders now, but uh, older patients, I think you've just got to assess, can you, can you get fixation that will uh, hold a reduction and, and what's their, and then what's their function level? It, to me, if they're very low functioning, not lifting a whole lot and low demand, you may consider total elbow arthroplasty. It's just, you, you've got to be sure because it's a no lifting more than 10 pounds for the rest of their life. And, and they're typically only lasting from what I hear from people that do them five to 10 years. So that's a, that's a big commitment to make. Absolutely. Fantastic. Well, that's a great, great construct. I love it. Yeah. Beautiful case. And I think, you know, some really important uh, uh, points came up and, and, you know, I think we have just scratched the surface. I think one thing that's really interesting in super humerus fractures is sequencing, you know, where you start, um, uh, you know, and, 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 you know, how you think about uh, uh, building back an, an anatomic reduction, you know, do, do you start the articular surface? Do you start at the medial column? Do you start the lateral column? And I think this case sort of started to bring some of those things into, into view. And I think that James cases are going to bring that into view even more. And we're going to start to talk about and think about um, when, when, uh, when, and what are the indications to do an electron on osteotomy. All right. So with that being said, let's move on to to uh, case number two and case number three, and uh, James, I'll let you uh, I'll let you take it away. Great. Well, it's going to be hard to top that, but uh, we're going to show uh, two cases relatively quickly. So, this is a 31 year old female fell while skating. No ice around here, but uh, roller skating. Had this closed elbow fracture and um, got AP and sort of a AP oblique and then a lateral view, kind of typical emergency room imaging, um, and. Again, we're looking at more of a, you know, sort of an incomplete or like a, a B plus type fracture. So it's not really a huge, a, a typical split, but we're looking at definitely some articular involvement, um, but sort of a large articular component, sort of having a functional dislocation here. Um, and with this, you know, we can talk about imaging and advanced imaging looking at the lateral view, if you can't get an understanding either through traction or a lateral um, 
really understanding what the plane of the injury is, then a CT scan may help. And I think we've got a, a three-dimensional reconstruction of this one. Um, and just remembering that these are, are volume averaging. So there's going to be a lot of detail loss. So it's good for overall, but don't think that this is as accurate as the axial imaging um, used to obtain this stuff. So unlike the last one, we've got a nice intact medial epicondyle, but you always have to watch for that trochlear impaction uh, into the olecranon fossa, but a little more involvement around the capitellum in this one. And for me, decision-making is always the same sort of thing, approaches, positioning, how am I going to image, how am I going to obtain a reduction, how am I going to stabilize it? Um, I think if we go to the next slide, it sort of like looks through some of those decisions that we have to make. James, one thing I wanted to point out before we yeah. moved on, though, because I found it very useful in my practice, and, and you alluded to it, and that is, is, is that, you know, medial column one big piece? I mean, uh, I have been fooled more times than I'd like to admit, uh, not understanding that, that in fact, the, the metadocaceal uh, component of the medial fracture and the medial epicondyle are actually a separate piece from the trochlea. Yeah. And, and that by reducing my metaphyseal component of the fracture, I still have an angulated trochlea. That's happened to me more than I would like to admit. Um, so, so you made a very important point there. You're so experienced and so good. I think you made it subtle, but um, for people like me, I think it needs to be made not so subtle. So, <laughs> so good well, job. One of the things that I started looking at is the transition into the olecranon fossa. Um, especially in one like this, if you're going to go paratricipital and, and do that arthrotomy, I think that's really critical. If you're even if you're not going to do an osteotomy, is really looking at how the the cranial part of the trochlea posteriorly transitions into the olecranon fossa. And if that's a 90 degree angle, you've got impaction. It's a tight curve, but it's a curve. It's a transitional piece of bone. And looking to see if that's shortened and impacted up in there. Number one, you'll never get the articular reduction all to add up. And number two, it's going to affect their articular articulation of the elbow. So it's definitely, uh, yeah, I've, I've developed that skill through, through mistakes over and over and over again that I always look for it now. Good, you and me both. <laughs> I think this is also really helpful if you look at that 3D surface rendered image, just to see where the olecranon is and what an osteotomy would get you because it may be a more aggressive a capsulotomy or for this one where it looks like the comminutions out near the capitellum and ankeneus peel you know may get you visualization without needing to add the add the surgical fracture to the olecranon uh and whatever risk come with it i i don't think the olecranon osteotomy is bad i just think it needs to be worth it if you're going to create another fracture for visualization yeah and I think that's where taking the time, don't just accept the rotations that the, that the radiology tech gets you if it's not the one you need to see. And in this one, I think this is the view right here is so critical is looking at the lateral extent of the olecranon of the ulna and then where that sits relative to the split in the articular surface. And in this one, I think exactly what you said, Josh, is what benefit is that actually going to get you compared to just a careful capsulotomy? Um, and I just, in this case, I don't think it's going to get you much. Um, and so, you know, being willing to pull the trigger, but also this is one where I wouldn't default to saying we're going to do the osteotomy on our way in. We're going to, we're going to attempt reduction and see what sort of a, an articular reduction we can obtain without, because it, it also gives you an ability to manipulate if you still have that intact and can, can pull on that medial side with a little ligament taxis. Yeah, I think you can, I tried to stop it here. I think you can see that really well. You know, I mean, you can see what portion of the distal humerus, the, the, the um, uh, olecranon is covering up and it is, it, is, it is medial to where your lateral uh, articular fraction. So again, yeah. ask yourself, you know, I mean, the, the, the criteria or the, 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 you know, the, the um, when to do an osteotomy and not to do an osteotomy cannot be as simple as articular extension. That's just, you know, I, I think that's something that we're gonna try to drive home here tonight. You know, and in this example, taking the electron off is probably not going to help you a whole lot, as you all said. Yeah. So, you know, decision trees are so important and preoperative planning is really important. And, and you probably, as, as surgeons get more experience, we do a lot of that planning in our head. Um, but I think working through that decision tree, even if you do it in your head, is still important to do. So if we go to the next slide, just talking about how am I going to get this patient where I can see what I need to see? Am I going to need an osteotomy? 
what sort of construct am I going to want? Do I need accessory implants, a little mini frag on a buttress, you know, on a spike before I have my definitive implants? I, I think all these decisions, you don't necessarily have to make the decision. You just have to know what either end of that decision is going to take you toward so that you can make those decisions. It's like planning, like Josh just moved from Texas to California. When you're driving from Texas to California, you got to take certain highways and you got to know which ones you want. Now you might make a decision and you're getting through cities and traffic and closed roads. You might make a decision to take one highway versus another. You can't make that decision until you're there, but you at least have to know the general idea of where you're going because there's no GPS for surgery. <laughs> All right. Although I'm sure so, someone's trying to make Google maps for, yeah. for orthopedic cases. Yeah, <laughs> maps. All right, let's see what we did here. So I just kind of a, a sequence all at once. So just work yourself left to right here. Um, if we go forward to the, to the fluoroscopy, so you're seeing a lot of clamps. We've got some wires and uh, kind of like Josh used, we've got a couple independent lag screws and wires and then clamp onto the plate. Oh. James, can I interrupt you there for one Please. sec? I'm gonna bring it back here. I mean, I, I think that, you know, you do this without even thinking, but you know, may, maybe this might help somebody. I mean, again, I think sequencing is so key when you're thinking about, you know, fixing these, these fractures and just, you know, am I gonna start lateral? Am I gonna start medial? Am I gonna do a B to C conversion? Am I gonna fix my articular surface first and do a C to B conversion? Uh, you know, I think you, you obviously, you know, I think here start on the medial side. I think that makes perfect sense. We have a really crisp uh, uh, opportunity to get a nice uh, read on our reduction and really, uh, maximize our chance of fixing the articular surface right by starting on the medial side in this example. And, and, and you know, we have that nice proximal extension of that medial spike. There's not comminution like there was in, in, in Josh's case. So, you know, for me, whenever I'm pre-op planning these, when I'm doing my, you know, as you alluded to the GPS kind of thing, uh, one of the most important questions after approach and osteotomy and neural osteotomy is, where am I going to start? Am I going to, am I going to start in the metadopsis? I'm going to start on the articular surface and this screams to me start please start on the medial side put that medial spike back because it's going to help you with that more difficult distal comminuted uh, lateral uh, uh, capitellar piece yeah yeah 100 percent agree the fracture line simple medial it looks like you did that with clamps and then some lag screws to replace the work of the clamps but that is uh keep it simple i i, I never underestimate my own ability to screw stuff up but, you know, seeing that simple fractional, and I love the clamp applications, you know, if you can hold things with clamps and plates aren't doing work, they're just, they're just maintaining the work the clamps did. And we got this, this light screw here that right at the apex, if you think about the fracture line, so, you know, that allows you to then remove your clamp, put your plate, dial it into position, a couple of nice lag screws to really secure that fracture line along the medial side that had the majority of the joint. And, just like in Josh's case, we've got a lot more comminution and, and a challenging reduction to maintain down distally, in this case on the, um, on the lateral side. And so by using that medial side first, do the simple one first, you know we can get that just right. We don't have bone loss and comminution from a ballistic injury here. So it's a much more straightforward fracture to align as long as you debride all the, the muscle fragments out of it, it's just, it usually these go click and the fracture disappears. And now all of a sudden we're working with going from C to B, right? So we've taken a complete articular injury and now we've just got this capitellum to worry about. And then we've got it secured from the medial side. We can build that reduction, a little intraarticular wire here, maintaining the smaller shear fragment and then uh, running screws interfragmentary through the plate uh, and then the right-hand side, you can see a clamp actually sort of squeezing the plates together so we can place those screws with everything working hard. James, I think that's great. I think the other point of, you know, and I showed it earlier, my malreduction on the initial attempt. When you're doing paratricipital, you need to, what, to assess your reduction, you need to be working back and forth between both windows because it may look great, but if you're just a degree off, especially with a long fracture line, when you come down to the joint surface for a long oblique fracture line, that degree off or that rotation may magnify the, the further you are from that malreduction. And th this looks great and it's a great sequence, but just for, for everyone on the call, be working back and forth in both windows, just like you do for a talus or anything else where you've got two windows, you have to assess that reduction at both sides before you 
before you buy it, or you should. You don't have to, but, but I'd recommend you assess the reduction visually on both sides before you buy it. Yeah, I, I, I would echo that 100%. Yeah, uh, you know, and, and interestingly, I, I, you know, looking at your choice of implants here, I think this is one time, you know, for me, who's maybe preferentially an orthogonal player, I think parallel plating here is nice in so much as you have the opportunity to squeeze that capitellar piece to the, you know, to the intact trochlea, whereas if you're plating from the back, you're pushing that capitellar piece into the air, uh, you know, so uh, this is a, I mean, your, your choice of plating here uh, makes a lot of uh, sense, sense, at least to me. Uh, as well. Yeah. So um, we can move on to the uh, final imaging, which I think we got a little preview of. But this is where we're at. Uh, a couple of questions on same height implants. Yeah, there is some evidence that it's a stress riser. Um, we've had, knock on wood, had not had issues. Um, depending on the plate, sometimes you almost wish they had shorter plates. These are the shortest ones. Um, because you really don't need a whole lot of extent here, but you need adequate strong fixation. This is a young person, kind of a medium energy fall. Um, so in this case, I, we have gone, I still get kind of a, a little bit dis discomfort. I try not to end my screws quite like this, is, uh, but it's also a, a nice spread out fixation. I think it's less of a problem. All right, so that's fracture number one from my end. So let's look at a different fracture and see some different decision making. So now we got a 49 year old female, another fall from standing, but a very different pattern. Uh, we have got some impaction. Um, looks like we've got a little more articular comminution. And in this one, I think that central image and the right hand image really show the trochlea really getting impacted and being a free fragment having an oblique fracture line across it. It's a very different animal from the last one we saw. Um, and so I think some of those decisions we talked about, how are we going to access it? How are we gonna visualize our reduction? Um, those are gonna be different questions we have to answer here. And so uh, in this case, uh, I am far more likely to go on to an osteotomy when the fracture looks like this. Uh, than when the fracture looks like the last one. If I have no metaphyseal extent or poor metaphyseal extent on at least one side, if I've got impaction and especially comminution in the middle of the trochlea, it's kind of hard to see it on this one, but there's a piece um, kind of at the, the central portion of the trochlea that's impacted. And that's just very, very hard for me to access without an osteotomy. Josh, for, for, same for you. You know, I see, I see this one, and I the first thing that concerns me is the mechanism. And so she's 49, and this tells me she's probably has osteoporosis or, or is well on her way because I see a lot of comminution of the joint surface. I think attraction view, it, you can see we have one. It, it didn't give me that much here, but I still see angulation of the medial side. And, and I think this is going to be pretty comminuted when we get a CT scan. Uh, at the articular surface and I can tell you I'm probably going I'm from what I see here I'm probably going straight to the osteotomy and not even doing paratricipital and looking Th this one this one has all the signs to me that it's I'm going to need to see and I'm not going to see well without uh getting the olecranon out of the way yeah I, I want to sort of um, just kind of re-emphasize or 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 focus on on, on what you both said and, and you know because I heard two kind of uh, decision-making points for when to do an osteotomy. And I think whenever you talk about these fractures, that's really uh, um, an important discussion point. James, you, you mentioned uh, that there was no proximal extent of the fracture here. And I, I think that probably most of our participants, you know, um, have heard people talk about or in their own practices of experience needing to do an electron and osteotomy for complex articular involvement, meaning multiple fracture lines or fracture lines that involve, you know, coronal fracture lines in the coronal plane. So complex articular involvement, multiple fracture lines, fracture lines with comminution, fracture lines behind the, the, the electronon process, or fracture lines that are present in the, in, the, in the coronal plane. But the other, and I think a lot of people know that, but it, I think the thing that at least for me 
um, isn't emphasized uh, enough is, is what that proximal extent of the articular fracture looks like. So in the previous example you showed, there was a beautiful proximal extension of that fracture for us to do a C to B conversion. And I always use the example, it's like when you're trying to put a puzzle back together, it's much easier to get the right puzzle, puzzle piece in place when you have a read on two sides as opposed to when you have a read on, on, just, on just one side. So, you know, this is a nice compare and contrast that previous case where we had nice uh, non-comminuted metadophyseal uh, extension of the fracture, which allowed a C to B conversion. And we do not have that opportunity here. So, you know, this has two reasons, at least, that I think about for doing anilacrine and osteotomy. And that's complex articular involvement. I don't have a great lateral, so I don't know if it's coronal plane, but there, it looks like complex articular involvement, number one, but then no proximal metadophyseal read for me to, to make my articular reduction easy, so, or easier. So, so for sure, for me, this is an osteotomy. Great. Yeah, well, that's, you know, it's, uh, it's definitely what we chose, you know, being in an academic place, it's definitely something where I feel we probably pull the trigger on an osteotomy a little more uh, than really fussing with a fracture for a while, but this is one that takes no decision making for me, um, that I'm, we're going to do this this way 10 times out of 10 on the way in. We go forward to the next slide. We'll show our sort of uh, sequence here. Uh, it's the same idea, same same decision making, but it's obviously different decisions, different solutions to the same types of problems. So same positioning, but I'm much more likely to go straight to an osteotomy in this one. Um, posterior lateral versus lateral plating just depends on the the overall trajectory of the of the fracture lines and how we can get the the right implants to hold it, um, and then. This one, since it doesn't have a long metaphyseal spike, sometimes I'll use a miniature fragment plate to hold that spike down and act as a washer for some lag screws and then use a lateral plate, but this one doesn't really have that. So sometimes using an accessory third plate or something to, to add a little bit of uh, help and take away some degrees of freedom. All right, so the big reveal here. So, you know, with this one, I think understanding where the trochlea is, where the capitellum is, and sort of how to reduce it and how to maintain stability. We got traction here, ligament ataxis is doing nothing. So we're really going to have to work on getting those pieces down. If you just click one forward, we'll see sort of the outline of some of the different pieces. You know, so we got comminuted trochlea and medial epicondyle, capitellum is comminuted in red there. And this one, there's going to be that section that's sort of impacted um, that it's going to be important to disimpact from both the coronoid fossa and the olecranon fossa. So we can go forward here. So this one is, you know, we went straight to the osteotomy and uh, you can see here on the right-hand images that we stabilize it with a cannulated screw and a washer. My, my caveat with this is that I would, this one, unlike a plate, I drill this ahead of time. Uh, because you want to know exactly where that straight line is. If you drill your start point, like any nail, if your start point is off, the, the screw is going to go straight. So you want to make sure you get your start point in line with the canal so you don't create a malreduction with placing that screw later on. So I will drill that on the way in before I do the osteotomy. And then it's all open work. It's just uh, getting the chondral fragments back together. And of course, we don't have a ton of images. You can see I do have some independent lag screws running lateral to medial from the capitellum into the trochlea, very distal, and then getting a couple of screws from either plate to work across the fracture and sort of meet in the center of the articulation. And then we have one lag screw uh, just avoiding the olecranon fossa, but helping to reduce some of the, the proximal extent there. And then here we've staggered our plates uh, in length and, and flaring that most proximal screw up. Uh, did not need to mobilize the radial nerve, but we saw it coming around as we use this plate. Um, and then kind of blocking our, our visualization on the lateral view. And I think there may be a slight malreduction here because uh, we have that small piece of metaphyseal bone flaring out. But overall, we've got this, the anterior humeral line bisecting the capitellum. I'm pretty happy with this overall. Uh, 
James, can I ask you in this with, um, you know, so we've talked, uh, you know, a, uh, you know, C to B conversions or C to A conversions. And I thought, you know, I just obviously, I think most of our participants have a handle on that, but just going back to AO, you know, basic uh, kind of stuff, uh, you know, A, we, we mean extra articular fracture, you know, B, we mean a partial articular fracture, and C, we mean a complete articular fracture, and we're sort of talking about that. But for you, did you start with the articular surface first and then reattach that to the to the metaphysis, or did you, were you able to find a read on one side and work clockwise or counterclockwise? Um, you know, how did you sort of, how did you sequence this? Usually when I've got the impacted trochlea, then I'm going to go create a well-reduced articular surface from trochlea to capitellum, turn my C fracture into an A fracture, and then I'm going to use clamps or something to secure that to the metaphysis and then try to replace those clamps with plates. Um, in this case, I've got those independent lag screws. So you can see that I reduced it and then got those running right along the articular surface before anything else was on. Uh, one of them is kind of anterior. You can see on the lateral view where the screw and the guide wire is still in. Um, however, there are times when it's hard to get everything to behave because a lot of times these fracture planes run kind of obliquely and there's not an easy clamp trajectory. And so there are times that I will put my first screw through a plate and sort of do a, a C to B. But this one I, I did C to, or C to A. Yeah, I think that, that makes sense based on those preoperative uh, pre x-rays. Uh, a question hey, came up in the discussion. Yeah, yeah I, was going, I was going to bring up some of the discussion group questions yeah, about athlete. the osteotomy, James. One was about transverse or V-shaped osteotomy. And then I think there's another question that I even had of, have you augmented your fixation here? Is this just a screw? Because my concern, and I, I use this technique a lot. I learned it from Andy Agelsater, uh, usually long screws, 120, 130, even solid. But it, seem, it seems like that proximal segment could rotate around the smooth shank of that partially threaded screw so you could lose reduction. To, is there a role for mini frag plate tension band with either wire or suture? Kind of how do you think through that? And then how does your osteotomy look? So I do a chevron, a, a apex distal chevron osteotomy. So the negative of that is you're in the bare spot in some of it, but you're not in the bare spot in everything because it's running the bare spot of the articular surface isn't going to run that same chevron pattern. Um, but the benefit is that it is an inherently stable osteotomy so that pure compression really, it, it could translate uh, anterior posterior, but it doesn't want to rotate. Um, and I have used suture augmentation, but usually only if I can't get really good fixation. Um, you can see I have my guide wire much further down the ulnar shaft. Uh, we actually tapped this one because I wanted to get a feeling of how tight the ulnar diaphysis was gonna get. And my, my uh, if you see the image, the third image over the AP after that screw is in, I usually stop it about here because that ulna has, the, has a various bend to it. And so putting a straight screw, that's where you start to get a little more resistance. You get better fixation there, but if you try going beyond it, it starts to want to kick the, the, there's a little more bending forces on the screw and it just starts to impinge. Yeah, I think that tapping to measure is critical. And I think you'll see a lot of literature on screws failing, but if you, since the screws don't engage the endosteum in the diaphyseal portion of the ulna. Um, and yeah. I think here you've got a long screw with, you know, diaphys diaphyseal engagement. But e even with that, I've seen some of these uh, fail without some kind of augment proximally uh, where it will rotate even with a good reduction. But um, it it's just something where I've been burned. So I tend to add something, whether it's a wire, as a tension band or a mini fragment plate, just as an anti-rotation device in that proximal segment. Yeah, and I think those are good points. It's, it's definitely something I've, I have used in some cases. And in this one, we chose not to. Um, but I would definitely have that ready to ready to go. Again, that's part of that preoperative planning is sort of getting all the things ready so you you can choose to do things and you're not forced to do things. I think I've got some post imaging here. So for these, I think you know the compare and contrast between the two cases that I had was just really showing one where. An osteotomy, I think in this case, made the case. I don't think I would be able to accurately reduce the articular surface without that. Versus the first case I showed, 
it's not really necessary. Um, and I think if you if you chose to do one, you would be able to visualize it differently, but I don't think you'd be able to visualize it better. Agreed. So J Josh, would you just, I mean, again, I think it's an important topic. Uh, you know, when you're teaching your residents or, or your fellows, like, uh, you know, what are your sort of, when someone asks you, well, when do, when do I need to do an echolacanonasi? I mean, when, when do you do one? How, how do you kind of make that simple for your learners? It's when I, when I can't see what I need to see without it, which is the, you know, if, if we're just in, on basic AO principles, it's, you know, anatomic reduction of the articular surface, stable rigid fixation of that. And if I can't see uh, to either reduce or to place implants where I need to, and usually it's reduction, uh, I'm going to do the osteotomy. And, and that's what I, for the participants, you know, you may have people that do a, a ton of elbow work and can see a lot more with a paratricipital approach. But if, if you get into these cases and can't see what you need to see, do the osteotomy because you don't want that articular malreduction at the elbow. I, I think it's, I think it's, if you can't see, do the osteotomy. Excellent point. Yeah. I mean, I think principles based decision making will never steer you wrong and those principles we learned way back when in our AO basic kind of helped the steers to make patient-centric decisions for sure. James, anything else you wanted to add about this this case? Are there, are there questions that are still uh, hanging out there in, in, in the chat, Josh? Uh, so there's a question about the trap approach for the third case and then any tips on the LUCL repair if it's injured? Yeah, these, I, I don't usually do a, a enough of a dissection. I feel I have to repair the LUCL. Um, there's, you got to dissect around the backside uh, and sort of to the epicondyle, but I try not to, to lift the ligament off. Usually they're stable with the impaction injuries. Um, if it is, I have had cases with a, a concomitant uh, radial head and lateral ulnar collateral ligament injury. And so I have augmented a, a suture repair with an anchor and it gets a little more challenging because your real estate is limited and you may have a fracture line running through your center of rotation where you'd like an anchor to be placed. But um, yeah, it's just, it's just adding one more step and one more, one more area that, that you need to stabilize. Well, that's great. I mean, I think we've seen three very uh, uh, educational cases so far and some themes have arisen, you know, namely, uh, 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 understanding how to sequence these injuries, uh, where to start, um, and, and with these two cases in particular, understanding uh, our approach options and whether or not uh, we need to do an olecran on osteotomy. And I hope that for the participants, they've got a little better sense for, for, for where to start and, and, and when to take off the, the, the olecran on. We have one additional case we want to show. Was a, a completely different different approach. This is a little bit of a of a bonus case, and and we don't want to take too long on this because we do want to get uh, uh, have an opportunity to to discuss some evidence around uh, around the ulnar nerve. Uh, but just just real briefly, this is a, this is a case of mine that that we did actually just just a week or two ago. This was an 80 year old female who sustained a fall. Uh, these were uh, her her initial X rays, and I think the astute uh, uh, observer out there can, can see that, that, that in this lateral view, you can really see almost the entire profile of the, of the capitellum uh, uh, in, the, in the trochlea. Obviously, uh, also a, a, an olecranon fracture and then some lateral uh, kind of epicondylar involvement, which, which for the most part was, was extra articular, but um, was something that we, were, that we were thinking about. But, you know, uh, we, we, Every case we've talked about so far has been, you know, either prone position or lateral position in a in a posterior approach. And 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 I'm not going to um, put put James or Josh on the spot too much uh, with this one. But 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 when we thought about this, we we kind of wondered if if a posterior approach at all was the was the right answer. Um, so I, again, I think a CT scan is very helpful for an injury like this. This would sort of fall into that category of a of a coronal shear fracture pattern. This is I don't have a video, but these are just three-dimensional shots. This is looking at it from the lateral side. You can see that small lateral kind of epicondylar piece. You can get a, a sense for that, that, that uh, trochlea slash capitellar shear piece. Uh, this is an important view, you know, when you're sort of pre-op planning this because, uh, again, you know, a, a critical decision here, there wasn't that many pieces. So maybe sequence is not as important a decision, but, but approach is a really important decision. And, and, and you know, 
I think you get a sense here, uh, looking at this from the posterior side, again, what, what, what Josh said, I think is very, a very useful rule of thumb. And I guess the question I would ask you and the question we asked ourselves is, is, is taking this olecranon off actually gonna, gonna allow me to see what I need to see? Um, you know, you can see that the, the posterior portion of the, 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 uh, the, the, the trochlea and the capitellum is actually intact. That, that, that's really a coronally based fracture. So I would ask you, you know, I mean, maybe, you know, you could probably see some of it through an electron osteotomy, but is that the, the ideal, uh, ideal approach or do you need to do something different? And then this is looking at it from the medial side. <clears throat> Again, you get a real sense here for that, 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 um, that, that coronal shear fracture pattern um, um, that's, that's present. So for us, this was a, you know, a completely different approach. This was, we, we chose to, to put the patient supine to use a hand table and to actually do a, sort of an anteriorly based approach, if you will, uh, going to the medial side and, 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 and doing an over the top approach uh, to gain access to that, that partial articular uh, uh, shearing injury. And we were able to visualize it beautifully uh, get good uh, uh, read uh, uh, on a reduction and actually see far enough across lateral to get, get a good reduction on either side. Sometimes you need to go from both the medial and lateral side in a, in a, in a fracture uh, like this. And this was sort of, this would, was the ideal, um, we got it reduced or, or, or felt like we got it reduced fairly well. And this was the ideal trajectory for our instrumentation. Uh, uh, but uh, this, this proved to not, in this 80 year old bone to not get us enough fixation on the backside, right? So this is a partial articular fracture, but, but the posterior cortex here was not so competent. So when we put in our fixation here, we were not getting adequate fixation. So we actually elected to, to work uh, both through an sort of anterior medial approach and uh, through what amounted to an olecranon and osteotomy through the olecranon fracture, not so much for visualization and reduction, but actually for, for appropriate placement of our of our uh, of our uh, implants, so this allowed us to get into more proximal metaphyseal bone that 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 had better bites. So we were able to to do that uh, uh, sort of with a combined approach, if you if you will. Um, so anyway, interesting case in so much as that it was not the typical you know olecranon osteotomy versus no olecranon osteotomy. It was actually do we do, do we come in from a different different uh, uh, direction altogether? Josh or James, any any have you seen similar cases? Do you feel like I could have gotten that? Uh, simply by reflecting the extensor mechanism through that through that uh, through that electronon fracture. I, I think you may have been able to hyperflex and see, but I don't think you'd have been able to see the proximal extent of the coronal shear. I you know I I think I'd have chosen the same thing you did that Hotchkiss over the top approach along the lateral column. Uh, maybe I I think the screw maybe I'd have done a maybe I'd have put a plate on, but not having been there. It looks like you've got a great reduction, and I think a lot of time that's kind of a game time call whether I'm going to run a lateral column plate in addition to screws front to back. It looks great. James, anything you want to add before about, we? It's all about um, I think about with Latronel talking about what you can see and then what you can feel, and I I think this one you would have been able to feel all the way up, but you wouldn't have been able to see, and I don't know if you'd be able to instrument uh, and stabilize it any other way. So I, I really like what you did here. All right. So just, you know, just a different sort of perspective, uh, you know, than the usual kind of posterior electronon osteotomy versus not. So what we'll do now uh, in the absence of any uh, unanswered questions, and I'll rely on James and, and Josh to make sure I'm not moving things along too quickly here, but I do want to get to our, to our journal article. And, and the article that we chose to present to you all is, is, is ulnar nerve transposition benefit Bene uh, beneficial during uh, open reduction internal fixation of distal humerus fractures. I think you've already heard, especially in Josh's uh, uh, case, a really thoughtful discussion from an extraordinarily experienced uh, a surgeon in a very high volume center about how they, they, they manage this. But, but we felt like it was important maybe to, to look at some evidence behind this as well. Uh, you know, when you fix these fractures, you, you, you can't hide from it. You, you gotta really have a strategy uh, as to how to handle the ulnar nerve and, and, and when you need to transpose and when you don't. So this was published in the Journal of Orthopedic Trauma in 2010. Um, uh, for those of you that, 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 uh, um, that haven't had the opportunity to read it, we'll just kind of go through it very quickly and then maybe offer a little bit of commentary on it. So it was a retrospective review uh, um, uh, from two centers uh, of 170 consecutive patients treated between mm -hmm. Uh, 1996 and, and, and 2005, the patients uh, uh, were required to have a minimum of uh, six months of 
of follow-up to be included in the study. And, and after those uh, exclusion criteria were applied, they ended up with a cohort of 137 patients. This was sort of uh, surgeon uh, specific and, and, and I would imagine center specific as to whether or not the, the ulnar nerve uh, um, was transposed. One institution did not routinely transpose the, the, the ulnar nerve except for in sort of unusual circumstances. And we can talk about what those, what those were if, 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 if it comes up or if people are interested. Uh, and the second institution uh, uh, routinely transposed the nerve if the nerve uh, contacted the medial plate. And, and I have to say, at least in my experience when I'm fixing these, uh, that would be a, a large number of them because quite commonly, unless from the outset you're creating this periosteal sleeve that, that Josh has spoken of, uh, when you're done and your fracture's reduced and you're putting your electron on back on, you, 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 you do notice that the ulnar nerve is very frequently at, at some point of its course in contact with that medial plate. So, so this is uh, the the uh, um, the makeup of the of the two two groups, and you can see that that, that as far as uh, uh, the p values go, there are uh, significant uh, uh, cohorts with uh, or excuse me, equivalent cohorts without significant uh, uh, differences. Uh, so no, you know, we can assume a relatively uh, representative uh, group on group on either side. Uh, and this is really sort of the, the, the meat of the results and the, and the meat of the paper, uh, if you will. And, and, and if you look at that figure, I think the results are a little bit striking in, in that there was almost a, a four-fold increase in incidence of ulnar neuritis when, when, when the ulnar nerve was underwent a formal transposition, um, uh, which, you know, uh, obviously you can see here uh, um, reached statistical significance. Um, so, you know, you read through the discussion of this paper, and, and, and it, it seems like the authors are really making a strong argument against routine transposition of the uh, routine transposition of the ulnar nerve. Um, so, uh, 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 with that being said, I would, I would, I would, I guess, uh, ask James and, and Josh. Uh, uh, you know, I'm sure you're familiar with this study. It's a, it's sort of an important study in orthopedic trauma. What are your impressions of it? Uh, is this something that you base your practice on or, 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 or how do you feel about this study? Well, I think it's, it's reasonably well done. I mean, obviously we can, we can take the time and the patients to do a prospective study, but I, I think this is a, an important thing to look at. I don't think anyone's electing to do a transposition that feels like they don't know how to do it. So I don't think it's likely a technical error on the part of the surgeons that believed in the transposition. But then looking back, I think this is a really important reason why we should look at our results because hopefully when they, when they looked at this, they said, wow, we thought we were helping people and it turns out we might not be helping them, might be actually causing problems. Um, and I think that looking, you know, coming up with an idea like the presence of a medial plate, that seems like a very intuitive solution and a very intuitive reasoning. It makes sense. And yet it doesn't seem to be borne out in the actual evidence. Yeah, I think it, I mean, a, a prospective randomized study for something like this is going to cost five to seven million dollars. And I don't know any funder that's really going to be interested to pay for that, unfortunately, unless you have some private, you know, some some private funding from from private people. And most people won't want to study it. I, I think there's sometimes it's the best you can do is retrospective. You know, the surgeons on that study, the attendings are all very high quality surgeons. And I think it is valuable information. Um, I, I think not transposing, it's important. There might be reasons uh, you do it. Maybe they had preoperative symptoms that were severe and that may be a reason to do it or, or something else you see intra-op. But, but for me, this is large numbers from high quality, well-respected surgeons. And sometimes this retrospective data is gonna be the best data you're gonna get for some questions like these, uh, unless you can find someone to spend millions of dollars to to fund a randomized prospective study. I do think you've always got to ask technique because surgical techniques aren't standardized. We know who these surgeons are and know they're great, but they're, that can be any challenge with retrospective. It, it, may, it may not be the, the anterior transposition that's causing the neuritis. It may be the handling of the ulnar nerve intraoperatively. You know, that, that's, that's, an, that's any surgical study. That's a potential thing because we can't truly define the technique and standardize it between the two groups. But I, I think those are challenges, but I think this is good study from good surgeons uh, that's well done. And I, I do think this influences practice. Am, am I correct in, in, in assuming that both of you, that neither of you routinely transpose the ulnar nerve? No. Correct. 
You're, you're correct. You are correct. So, 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 Josh, I heard you say, um, you know, times you will consider uh, transposition is, is if they have pre-op cubital tunnel symptoms, you know, is there any, James, any intraoperative things that you, that you see that may change your mind about a formal, uh, formal ulnar nerve transposition? You know, some of the, the people that I train with, they talk about, you know, ranging the elbow after your fixation and looking for, for the nerve wanting to snap. I think depending on what your dissection looks like, you can probably repair it, not, not tightly, but you can repair it in a stable fashion so that it's less likely to subluxate from the under the medial epicondyle. And I think that's what I really like about this Eglisator technique that Josh has been showing is it's nice because you have a soft tissue sleeve you can actually work with as opposed to just opening it up and then being stuck with, I can either stenose it or leave it alone. I think if for some reason there there weren't capsule near the ulnar nerve that I could repair, you know, I think that point at, at the end of the case, ranging the elbow and making sure it stays where it belongs throughout range of motion. If at the end of the case, for whatever reason, whether it's traumatic or iatrogenic, I can't keep it there, I may consider transposing it. But I, I think that's, I would say it hasn't happened to me so far in my 10 years of independent practice. And you really sort of have to have this an idea of what you're going to do before you go in there, right? Because that, that technique that you showed, Josh, you, you need to do that. That's part of your approach. If you sort of thinking about, if you think about trying to create a sleeve of tissue after you've done your dissection and major capsulotomy where you need to, to reduce the fracture, it may be in a very different place from where you would make your capsulotomy to create a sleeve to, to cushion the ulnar nerve from a from medially based plate. So you know, it's important that you sort of go in, uh, uh, you know, with that, with that, with that plan, uh, plan ahead of time. You know, I, sure. I think I've been in, I've been in situations, you know, where, where, where maybe I didn't think about that enough or, you know, you've done your fracture dissection, everything looks beautiful. And all of a sudden you see the ulnar nerve kind of articulating with the medial plate and maybe it gets a little tight when you're in full flexion and you sort of feel like, get the sense that that's going to be an ulnar nerve that's not going to be happy rubbing against that plate. But then you don't have a sleeve of tissue, you know, to, to sort of sew between the nerve and the plate. Um, um, you know, you really got to think about that as part of your pre-op plan and as a part of your approach. James, other uh, other comments you you wanted to make uh, before we uh, sort of move to to transition to make sure all of our questions are answered and then try to bring home some, some take home points for our participants. No, I think this is a, what I like about this paper is it, it supports the thing that I like to do. No, but it's, it's a good, <laughs> good, it's good uh, messaging. It's a good example of what we should be doing, which is having a hypothesis and then looking at it to make sure that we actually are right. And I think what I like about this paper is the, the surgeons who said, you know, if it touches the plate, we should transpose it. If it's got this problem, we should transpose it. They looked at this and said, turns out we don't have those problems and we're actually, we have more problems by interfering. I think what Josh said about the surgical technique is the variable here that's impossible to standardize. You know, you do a hypertension study, everyone takes the pill the same way, but how people manipulate a nerve, how they dissect it, how they retract it, if they use a vessel loop on it, if they don't, you know, that all matters. And, and that's very hard to standardize into a study protocol. You can, yeah, you can really imagine how this study got started, right? I mean, you know, surgeons on, 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 a, on a webinar or learning situation like this, and, and, yeah. and Dr. Learned says, I always transpose the nerve and I don't have any, you know, ulnar neuritis. And Dr. Gary says, I never transpose the nerve and I never have ulnar neuritis. You know I mean? It's really, you're exactly right. It's sort of putting your money where your mouth is. Yeah. Uh, forgive the, the metaphor, but, you know, and that's what we need to do as surgeons is, you know, look at people who are very good at what they do and, and you know, compare and contrast techniques, but catch it, but keep it patient centric and, and outcome yeah. based. And, 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 and those debates become, uh, quite useful or, or quite beneficial to our patients. Yeah. Yeah, I bet this was not the result one of these sides was expecting. But I think that's, re and I think Someone... that's, I think that's really good in research. Like if you ever know your conclusions before you start the project, I, it may be okay to publish it. I just, 
you should never write your conclusions before you actually look at the data. That should, you should never do that. Great point. Great point. Yep, while well, you play the game. So um, one thing, I, so we're gonna sort of transition into uh, sort of closing statements and, and hopefully give you all some, some take home points to hang on to and to, to integrate into your practices to, to, to help people. Um, as we're moving to that, I would encourage you to uh, uh, type up any last minute uh, Q questions you may have in the, in the Q&A chat. Um, I hope we've been able to answer most questions, uh, but there's been a lot and there's a lot of participants, so we, we may have missed some and we have about 10 minutes or, or nine minutes to, to, to answer questions that we may not have gotten to. So if you have a burning question that was not addressed, um, going back all the way to, to Josh's first case, uh, please, please type that in there. I'm going to move to the take home points, but really, uh, if nothing else, to give you all some time to, to, to make sure that all of your questions are, all of your questions are answered. Okay, so we, we spent the last hour and a half or so talking about uh, uh, supracondylar humerus fractures. Again, I, I gave you my bias before. These are, I think, some of the most enjoyable fractures to fix, and, and, and maybe because they're very complex fractures, there's there's just uh, uh, so many variables that go into into this, into decision making with 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 these with these fractures. Um, uh, you know, uh, namely, I, I think sort of themes that came through tonight were were how do you sequence these? You know, where do you start? Uh, uh, um, and how do you make uh, you know how where do you start? And, and how does that make your uh, articular reduction as anatomic as possible? Because again, getting back to the AO basic principles, you know. Uh, anatomic reduction of these articular fractures, even in non-weight bearing joints, really, really drives outcomes. So, um, uh, you know, these are complex fractures. Uh, I think you saw with every single example, starting with Josh's example, with the low medial exit point, uh, to James' example of, 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 of a nice proximal medial exit point, and, 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 and lateral involvement that, that would not be uh, improved by uh, olecranon osteotomy to his last example of a very complex articular fracture. I think you saw that that approach and and fixation is really driven by the morphology of the fracture. And again, you know th this idea that 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 you know post your approaches are complete to the workhorse, but you also have to have other tricks up your sleeve if you get into some unusual situations, particularly when you start to look at sometimes a, a coronal plane uh, a pathology. The indications for osteotomy, maybe uh, I think we really tried to uh, make it as concrete and, and, and clear as we could. Um, uh, but but let's let's face it, they're a little bit relative, and, and certainly they're surgeon in, in, in case uh, a specific. But what I learned from from James and from Josh tonight is that uh, I do the osteotomy to see what I need to see to prioritize an anatomic uh, uh, articular reduction, uh, and and I learned that that you know sometimes. Uh, the extent of the metaphyseal fracture may actually impact a little bit my decision making about my olecranon osteotomy, which was something that I, I don't think I always appreciated. And then I think we spent a lot of time, uh, uh, appropriate, but spent a lot of time talking about that pesky ulnar nerve. Uh, uh, I think we all uh, admit and acknowledge that it needs special handling. And we looked at a little bit of evidence to, to help us decide when we actually need to do a formal, uh, formal uh, uh, ulnar nerve. Uh, 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 transposition. So with that being said, I'm looking at the last couple questions here. Um, I think the first one we answered any issue when both plates uh, end at the same level. I think James uh, discussed that with his uh, with his first case. Standing question that, that I see that we have about uh, six minutes to answer is, uh, when do you decide total elbow is the answer in these cases? For me, it's, it's, that it's what I talked talked about earlier it has a right the limitation with the total elbow is no lifting more than 10 pounds so if it's a young younger active person that's that's never going to be in the game the first time for me you know I, I can't see a reason I, I think an elbow fusion would probably be more durable in, in a young patient so I think fix it uh, so for me it's often the backup if ORIF fails I, I think the patients to consider it for primarily are elderly low energy falls don't have much, don't have high functional demands and have a limited life expectancy. That That's whenever I would think, all right, right out of the gate, we may need to go there. And, and then there are gonna be times if, if it's so comminuted and you can't get fixation, can't get stable fixation, maybe early on, but that may be an intraoperative decision too. Uh, 
and that's when you've got to have your planning ready and know that the total elbow is available. Uh, total elbow is available for you, but it's a it's a life changing operation for a patient once you do it in terms of the restrictions you're placing on them. I think really understanding what you're committing that patient to, like Josh just said about weight bearing restrictions and um, longevity of the implant, really understanding that prior to offering it as some sort of a, a, a solution and a panacea. Remember that patients, especially little old ladies who fall and break their elbow, have tons of friends who have hip replacements and knee replacements, and they don't know that elbow replacements are different unless we tell them. So our role as educators doesn't stop with, uh, you know, residents in training. It's educating our patients that this is not a hip replacement where you go back to life and you're playing golf again. This is a significant limitation, but it may be the only option we have. That's a great point. I mean, you know, people, yeah, that's right. People have friends that had a hip fracture and, and it's a completely different operation. You know, that's a, that's a good solution. That's a good arthroplasty solution for a problematic fracture. This is not, this is not the case at all. Um, a question came up about, um, you know, uh, discussing and setting expectations with patients preoperatively about range of motion. So Josh kind of hit on this a little bit, talking about he doesn't like to splint any of these people. Uh, and what do you tell your people? What, what's expected range of motion? What's acceptable range of motion? And, 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 and how do you maximize it? Yeah, I, I tell them up front, you can expect to lose terminal extension. Unless, unless it's a child, which, you know, we're talking about adults tonight, but it, I, I've almost always seen that loss of terminal extension. Uh, you can use dinosaur splints and some other things, but usually there's somewhere between a five and 10 degree lag uh, in my experience. And then I think the other range of motion, if we do our jobs and get stable fixation, I think most of it generally comes back if they participate in rehab. You know, they're going to be the rare people that get ectopic bone that will limit them and will need a release. And that's a different story. But I think if they don't have that complication and we get excellent reduction and stable fixation and allow them to range early, I think most people can get back if they if they do their part of the work to to get their elbow back. That usually usually most flexion will come back is what I've seen, unless there's ectopic bone or some kind of bony block anteriorly. Yeah, I I have a patient that I'm thinking of that had an extra articular fracture. I mean, you know three centimeters, four centimeters above the joint and just got very, very stiff. And we took him and did a manipulation. And then having been through arthrofibrosis, his commitment to rehab after the manipulation was flawless. And he's got, other than a very small lack of terminal extension, essentially normal range of motion. And I wish, I wish everyone, other, all the other patients would learn from his misfortune. Um, but it's it's a hundred percent dependent on the patient's range of motion. But it sounds like he was also fortunate. I think you pulling a trigger. I don't know when you do, but if I see if I'm seeing big blocks to range of motion or what I feel like is arthrofibrosis and not a block because of the ectopic bone that's forming, I'm trying to manipulate them usually between four and six weeks because yep. I don't want it getting to a point where I lose that motion. And I and I do think the the dyna splints or whatever kind of progressive dynamic splinting you can do on these patients. I've seen those help quite a bit as well in the patients that are getting stiff. But I, to me, a manipulation, yeah, it's an anesthesia, but if that's a very, very low risk situation to go in and regain range of motion if the patient's plateaued with therapy, or if they can't get it because they're under or non-insured, you know, that that's, I, I tend to think those patients can't, don't progress as well because having them do it at home uh, I think is more difficult than being at, being at an OT or PT's office. Yeah, very, very thoughtful responses. So, so, so with that, I think we will move to close this, this webinar. We're, we're, we're kind of right on time. We're about uh, 9.29 Eastern time. So, so uh, we have a hard stop at, at 9.30. I would like to, to thank uh, our panel, uh, uh, Dr. James Learned and Dr. Josh Geary for their really thoughtful uh, cases, insight, and, and pearls. And I, I know that, that I learned a bunch just from, from seeing those cases and talking through those cases with them. And I'm sure that, that our participants did as well. Also, a, a, a big shout out to, to our AO North America staff, uh, Mackenzie and, and Candice, who are sort of working behind the scenes the entire time to make this webinar what, what I feel to be a success. So thank you. Thank you both. And, and most of all, thanks to our participants for, for spending time away from your 
your responsibilities and your families and whatever else there is out there to to talk about and, and think about supercondylar humerus fractures with us. So with that, we'll close. Um, uh, thank you all for for being part of this and and, and have a great uh, have a great evening. Thank you.